In this presentation, we're going to cover the structure of the HIV genome and the function of the individual genes. Here's a map of the genome uploaded to Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons by Thomas Splaltz Doser. Sorry if I just slaughtered your name, dude. But out of all of the images of the gene map of the HIV genome that I have seen, I like this one the best because it shows a couple of really important things. The first thing that it shows is that we have three different reading frames. Now if you've had a genetics class, and I hope you have, then you understand that whenever you have your nucleotides, so you'll have three nucleotides, let's say an A, a C, and a T, right, like that. And each one of these will be grouped together and that will tell the, uh, the ribosome to, to make one specific uh, peptide or one specific amino acid. And so, well, if you had an A, C, T, G, A, for example, your ribosome, depending on where the start codon is, could have made this as a reading frame, starting with ACT and then moving on to the next three, we'll put another T there. Or it could have started right here and made this the reading frame and then moved on to the next one. And so you can see that there are three possible reading frames, and HIV cleverly has encoded genes into all three reading frames. Now most texts about HIV are going to get at least to the surface level and they're going to tell you that there are some structural proteins, those structural proteins being GAG, PAL, and INV. The GAG, I really don't know what GAG stands for, but PAL was named because it contains the polymerase, the reverse transcriptase, which is a polymerase. The INV because it encodes the two major envelope proteins, the GP120 and GP41. We'll talk about what those are, but the envelope proteins. And GAG, it just contains a whole bunch of virion structural proteins. But all three of these are grouped together and called structural proteins. The other thing this shows is that some genes are separated. So you can see that the TAT gene transcriptional activator is actually separated and it's in two different reading frames. This is important. And the REV gene, I've kind of marked through the word REV, the REV gene is also uh, similar. TAT and REV are known as regulatory proteins. So we have our structural proteins, we have our regulatory proteins, and the rest of them are classified as, as accessory proteins. Now a few things that the uh, image I just showed you didn't demonstrate is that there are several sp uh, splice donor sites that are usually labeled with a D and there are splice acceptor sites labeled as an A. So if you're looking at a, a picture of the HIV genome and it has D's and A's marked through it, those are just splice donor sites and splice acceptor sites. The mRNA can be spliced into 30 different mRNA uh, pieces or, or species and so that one HIV mRNA can become greater than 30 other mRNAs. And I already pointed out that it can read in all three reading frames. This is called being polycystronic. Now which reading frame you get the most of or the least of is dictated by two things. The first thing is how close is it to the five prime end of the mRNA and the second thing is what is the efficiency of of the uh, initiation codon. So in different uh, places different initiation codons are going to have different efficiencies. There's one other thing here that can affect what the reading frame is and that is whether or not we have a frame shift induced into uh, the, the peptide chain as it's growing and that I'll explain in a little bit but that's how we get all of the, the, pol, the POL Paul, uh, proteins. And another thing just to keep you cognizant of, all of the RNA is classified as whether or not it is unspliced, partially spliced, or fully spliced and that I'll explain in more detail later as well. And the major groups, I didn't point out in that image, that one of the major groups is called the LTR, the long terminal repeat. So the LTR segment is at the end of the genome. So you've got the, three, the, the five and three prime ends, and it's got this segment there that's called an LTR. That segment is actually what dictates whether or not the gene is, whether or not the virus is active or inactive. 
Then you have your structural proteins, which are the GAG, POL, and EMV. You have your regulatory proteins, TAT and REV, and the accessory proteins, VPR, VPU, VIF, and NEF. Now, even though it's a rate, an accessory protein, I like to classify NEF in with TAT and REV uh, for two reasons. First of all, it breaks all of these down into three groups of three. And the second reason is because TAT, REV, and NEF are all considered early proteins. They are transcribed and, and processed into proteins early in the life cycle, early after the HIV has infected the cell. And then all of the rest of the proteins are created late in the life cycle, late after the virus has infected the cell. And so you can think of it like this. You have LTR then you have these structural proteins and then you have the others of the others some are late proteins and some are early proteins and so here again is a map of the genome and I want to point out again there's the 5 prime LTR and the 3 prime LTR there's GAG, pol, and M which are the structural proteins then there is TAT, REV, and NEF which are your early proteins the TAT and REV are your regulatory then the VIF VPR and VPU are the accessory proteins. HIV gets incorporated into a cell, a T cell or a macrophage, and it becomes latent. So it's incorporated into the genome of the nucleus, and it becomes latent. And it can stay there for a long time until finally one day it wakes up again. So here's my T cell, and here's the nucleus. And so I get an external signal that acts on the cell and says, hey, you have a sickness. You need to do something about it. You're sick. And so that signal comes in to the cell. Now what happens in the cell is you have something called inhibitor of kappa B. And inhibitor of kappa B will sequester NF kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B, in the cytoplasm. When you get an external signal that says, hey, you, there's an infection, NF kappa B gets uh, tagged for ubiquitination, it gets destroyed, and it releases NF-kappa B to go into the nucleus and start transcribing the genes that need to be transcribed to fight off an infection. It just so happens, however, that the, the HIV DNA has in the LTR segment has a binding site for NF-kappa B, so when NF-kappa B comes in, it turns on virus production. Now I've used NF-kappa B as an example because it's uh, you know, a very well-known molecule, especially if you've taken immunology, everybody knows. There are several others, about a half a dozen other molecules or particles that combine to this LTR segment and either turn it on or help turn it on. And so I've written here that the LTR, it flanks both ends of the genome. You've seen that already. It's the site for NF-kappa B activated transcription. And there are many other protein elements that are active at the LTR segment. So when you have viral production, it's when the T cell is activated. So T cells are responding to signals of infection, and they will have the highest viral activity. Now, I remember a question bank giving me a question exactly like this. Question bank question was giving me a vignette of somebody who had been infected with HIV. It was latent and then that cell received some signal that said wake up and it wanted to know what part of the virus genome was affected by that signal. And the answer is the LTR segment. So there it is again. You have your 5' prime and your 3' prime LTR. Now this LTR, I want to say as a caveat, it has other uh, important sections within it that if you really want to know virology and understand this virus really well and study it in a lab, you need to know those things. For medicine, for being a doctor, you don't need to know those things. Not clinically important. Okay, now we're going to talk about GAG. So we have the RNA for GAG and the ribosome jumps on here and starts making this DNA, this peptide sequence. The N-terminal end of this peptide sequence, while it is being translated, gets meristolated. And by doing this, it tags it to go to the cell surface. So we'll shrink this down and we will draw our cell surface. And what we get is this GAG protein that is 
attached to the cell surface by this by being meristolated. And what his job is, is whenever you, have, so we have the nucleus here, and whenever that nucleus spits out a full functioning copy of HIV RNA, so I have this full functioning copy of HIV RNA, the, the gag protein's job is to take and attach two of them, to just grab a hold of two of them, so it wants to have two RNAs. So we say that it recruits two copies of RNA, so essentially HIV is diploid, I guess, and, and then it also recruits other proteins, so I'm just going to put a P over here, it recruits other proteins that ultimately lead to budding. So GAG is important, an important protein as an entire thing, it is important way before the virus buds off, but after it buds, let's shrink this down again, after it buds we have our our virus here, the gag is, is sitting here. There is inside of this virion a protein called uh, protease, and protease will start chopping gag up into small pieces. Those pieces will form a P17 segment that is called the matrix, and basically the matrix just attaches to the, the lipid membrane and forms sort of a, a structure. Then you have the P24 segment, which forms this capsid in the, mental, in the middle. It forms a conical-looking capsid. Then there's a P7 nucleocapsid that will uh, attach to the viral RNA, and there's also a P6 segment that doesn't have a name that I know of. So gag becomes all of those things. It literally is the structure of the entire thing. So gag called P55. Usually these are these P's I'm putting in in front of these numbers. The P just means it's a protein from HIV, and the 55 tells you how big the protein was. So when these were originally being studied and isolated and separated from each other, they would be able to identify this is what this 55 kilodalton protein does, and this is what the 24 and the 17 kilodalton protein, all those things. So that's how, that's why they have these numbers and names. And so you can see the N-terminus is meristolated during transcription. That helps it to attach to the membrane. It recruits two copies of viral RNA. It recruits other proteins leading to budding. Then you get into the second part after and during and after the budding. It is cleaved by, by protease, by the viral protease, to make a matrix protein called P17, a capsid P24, a nucleocapsid P7, and a P6. Now sometimes you're going to see books, texts, and, and sources on the internet that they don't have P7, they have something called P9. And let me explain that really quick. So if we took the entire gag protein before it's cleaved, over here you've got your P17, then you got your P24, then you have this little tiny spacer here, and then you have P7, you have another spacer right here, and then there's P6. This first spacer is called SP1. SP1 is two kilodaltons, and then you have the second spacer, which is called SP2, and SP2 is only one kilodalton. So this is, it, whenever SP2 and P7 are together, that's P9. If you can just remember 7, I can get every other number in this gag from the number 7. So I think 7, I got 24, 7, 7, and 17. And then also when I'm counting, I go from 6 to 7. So if you can just remember 7, and you can tie in those things, then you can remember all of these numbers. It's not that hard. Now I already told you that P17 becomes the matrix protein, and I told you that it makes up the inner surface of the, of the lipid uh, bilayer of this virion. But what I didn't tell you was that some tiny bits of it will go into the center of the virion and attach to pieces of the viral RNA. All in all, there is a segment of the viral RNA that will allow for attachment of various different proteins that end up becoming something called the pre-integration complex. This pre-integration complex is really necessary for HIV because HIV is one of a very, very few... So retroviruses in general will get into the nucleus of a dividing cell. It has to be dividing for the retrovirus to get inside. So HIV is unique because it will get inside of the nucleus of non-dividing cells. This is important it would not be able to invade, for example, a macrophage that is terminally differentiated if it could not get into the nucleus of a non-dividing cell. So this 
pre-integration complex, which is formed partially of P17. We'll see some other aspects that go into that as well. For example, VPR, you'll see, is part of that pre-integration complex. And this is what allows that viral RNA to get inside of the nucleus. So P24, all you got to know is that is the conical core of this, of this virion. What you can also remember, if you want to be extra smart, is that it interacts with something called cyclophilin A, and, and it can be inhibited by cyclosporin A. So this is all lab test tube type stuff, but it could become important clinically. So you remember I said that GAG wants to bind to two pieces of viral RNA. That's its job. Bind to two pieces of viral RNA. Well, this P7 or P9 segment is the segment that actually does that. So it's, it does that before it's cleaved into P7 or P9. I'm just pointing out that this is the segment of GAG that did that. Then afterwards, P7 stays attached to the viral RNA and it initiates or it helps to initiate reverse transcription. So you remember nucleocapsid, it sounds like nucleus, nucleus has DNA, you know that it's important for the, the RNA to become DNA. The P6 segment is important because it pulls in another accessory protein called VPR. So we've just looked at P17, P24, P7, and P6. Matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid, and attaches to VPR. Now when you're reading textbooks and big science books, you'll see something called Gagpol precursor, P160. So you can see that in frame, uh, for reading frame 1, we get the Gag protein. In reading frame 3, we get the Pol protein. If we were to transcribe RNA all the way to here, and we were to start reading, so let's get on this reading frame right here, and we'll start reading through here. There's a little spot right here in the RNA that causes it to, to causes the ribosome to just jump and shift reading frames, and it, it works about 5% of the time. And by shifting reading frames in that large piece of mRNA, we end up transcribing the proteins in the Paul gene. So this is why if you'll see GAG is produced 20 to 1 whenever you look at GAG to pole ratios within an infected cell. The pole protein is always produced in the context of the GAG pole and is therefore considered to be part of that whole gene. So it's a structural gene. It's really not a structural gene. You'll see what all the pieces do, but it's considered part of the structural genes. So like I said, it's cleaved from the gag pole. It's cleaved by the viral protease. And so after pole is released, it's further processed by, by viral protease. And one of the genes in this is the viral protease. So protease is one of the genes. Reverse transcriptase is another gene. And you know reverse transcriptase will take this RNA strand. It will put DNA bases on top of it. So it's putting these DNA bases on top of this RNA. Let me change the color of the RNA. So we got this RNA strand is red. And then what will happen is after those DNA bases are, are on it, RNase H will come back behind and start pulling out all of these RNA strand pieces. And then reverse transcriptase will go over, will go back the other direction and make the entire thing into DNA. So it has an, an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, and it has a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. There's two really important things about this. The first important thing is it only happens, it, th this is really only necessary one time after the viral infects the cell. Everything else, the cell's machinery, makes all of the copies of the RNA. It makes all of the proteins from that RNA. Our cellular machinery does all of that. But prior to, to uh, getting into the nucleus, prior, or prior to getting integrated into the cellular genome, this reverse transcriptase and this RNase H is what makes that possible. 
The second thing that's really important to note is that it doesn't have, it, it is highly prone to error. It doesn't really proofread as it's going, so it has a lot of error, and some portions of the genome are more prone to error than others. And then after it's done, the integrase, what the integrase does is, so I've got this um, double-stranded DNA, and I'm going to redraw it got this double-stranded DNA, and what it will do is it will come and it will cleave off a few nucleotides from this side, and it will cleave off a few nucleotides from this side, and then it will clip the, uh, the host cell DNA and form a single covalent bond on both sides. After it does that, the host cell machinery fixes everything else. Okay, so read through it. The pole has a protease. It's an aspartyl protease. It's required for the gag pole processing. Um, its 3D structure has been determined, which has led to protease inhibitors. This is why laboratory stuff becomes important, because if you know the 3D structure, you can make a medicine to, to interfere. Reverse transcriptase, it has an RNA-dependent and a DNA-dependent polymerase. It starts from single-stranded RNA to single-stranded DNA complex to single-stranded RNA. Uh, and then it, it forms the double-stranded DNA. It does that with the help of RNase H. The RNase H removes the RNA template from the first strand of DNA. The viral stem loop structure called TAR is the binding site for reverse transcriptase. So this TAR is important because it also is the binding site for something called TAT, which is a regulatory protein. Knowing the crystal structure of reverse transcriptase led to the production of NNRTIs. And then the integrase, I said, the, it's an exonuclease activity that trims the 3' prime end. Then it has a double-stranded exonuclease that cleaves the integration site. And then it has a ligase activity that makes a single-stranded link on each side. Then the cellular machinery fixes the rest. Integration site is another active uh, area of research, um, but there are places in the genome called integration hotspots, and they have to do with all kinds of, of things, not necessarily the DNA sequence itself, but many, many other things. I want to take a quick sidestep and talk really quickly about the pharmacology. How, how do you treat HIV infection? Because this is directly related to the proteins we just talked about. So you have nucleoside or nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are basically nucleosides or nucleotides that have a hydroxyl group missing from the 3' prime carbon. And, and so by having that hydroxyl group missing, Whenever they get it attached into the growing viral RNA, nothing else can be attached to them. So here you have this growing viral RNA, then you have this nucleoside uh, inhibitor uh, attached, and then it doesn't have a spot for the next thing to attach to it, so it just terminates the chain. It's called a chain terminator. I've listed some of these out. There's thymidine analogs, adavidine, which was one of the was the first. Um, it used to be called, I think, NZT. Stavudine, there's the cytidine analogs, the guanosine, and the adenosine. I want to uh, point out, I listed entecavir here. Entecavir is used for hepatitis B. The FDA has not approved it for HIV. Now, for the most part, if you want to remember these, these are the dean-seen beans. You can see that they end in vudine, dean, vudine, bean, and seen. There are the three exceptions that end in Kavir or Fovir. Then you have the NNRTIs, which do not look like a nucleotide or nucleoside at all. They are called non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And what they do is they go to this, uh, this, is my nucle uh, this is my reverse transcriptase protein. They'll just bind to a specific part of the reverse transcriptase to keep it from working. So these become non-competitive uh, inhibitors. You can remember these as verine, verdine, verapine. There are also some experimental drugs called Portman 2 inhibitors. These will inhibit both reverse transcriptase and integrase. Um, not extremely important to know, I just thought I'd point out. There's some other things called Portman 2 inhibitors. Basically, it's when you're, you're using one medication to inhibit two different important key steps in viral life cycle.
Then you have the integrase inhibitors. I'll point out that these are basically telling you what they do. These are saying that this is a viral inhibitor of integrase. So they all have tegravir. And then you have your protease inhibitors. They have the navir ending. I like how sketchy pharmacology did these. They called them the guinevere uh, medications, and guinevere was pulling a sword out of a stone, or something like that. Basically, there's a sword and a stone, guinevere, um, and the sword is, you know, to cut the protease. It's a protease. Now, you can uh, memorize all these if you want. I'll point out a few of them. Ritonavir is not really used as a protease inhibitor. It is a protease inhibitor, but it is not used as one. Ritonavir is primarily used as a P450 inhibitor. What it does is it blocks the breakdown of other uh, protease inhibitors and other, a whole bunch of other medications, but primarily antiretroviral medications. So instead of you taking your medication and the levels going up to a peak and then falling down, you take your medication, it goes up to a peak, and it just stays there because the uh, P450 is being inhibited. It can't break it down. And this uh, one medication has allowed for the once daily dosing of several other medications that used to be like multiple times a day, three or four times a day. Some protease inhibitors uh, appear to have antiprotozoal activity, and I'll also mention that there are protease inhibitors marketed for hepatitis C. These have the Previr ending instead of the Navir ending. So now we've looked at LTR, GAG, and PAL. Next we'll look at ENV. You can see that ENV has a GP120 and a GP41. So what's important about these is they get processed through the endoplasmic reticulum and through the Golgi apparatus. And while they're in the Golgi apparatus, they get glycosylated. So this is GP. GP means glycoprotein. All the rest of them are P's. But this is a GP and this is a GP. They are glycosylated about 25 to 30 times within the endoplasmic reticulum. So what I have here is I have my host cell, I'm going to call it a T cell, and I also have my virion, I'm just going to label it VIR, so my virion or HIV, and we can see here that they're interacting in some way. So if we zoom down in here, in the T cell what we see right here is this is going to be my CD4 receptor and right here is going to be the CXCR5 receptor. And over here you see that I have my ENV proteins that have been cleaved. ENV protein is a solid protein GP160 and it gets cleaved into GP120 and GP41. So here's my GP120 and then my transmembrane GP41. So GP41 has the transmembrane portion of the, of the ENV protein, and the GP120 sits on the surface and non-covalently interacts with the GP41. And you can see that they form a trimer. There are three uh, proteins grouped together, and they form the trimer that is the GP120 recept that, uh, receptor that binds to the CD4 receptor. The other thing you can see is that on the very side of this, I have uh, a little loop. This is called the V3 hypervariable region, or the V3 loop. And why is it called V3? Well, there are five hypervariable regions on GP120. So in GP120, there are five regions that get mutated very easily, and there are V1 through V5. And the third of those, the V3 loop, is what forms the co-receptor for either CXCR5, uh, I put CR5, this should say CXCR4, and the other one is CCR5. Now CXCR4 is a co-receptor expressed on T cells, and CCR5 is a co-receptor expressed on macrophages. Now, certain V3 loops, whenever they're mutated in a certain way, they will bind with the C, uh, CXCR4 and go into a T cell. Um, others, when they're mutated a different way, will bind with the CCR5 and go into a macrophage. Now, it's going to be hard to draw this, but what happens after binding is after this is all bound, all of this gets pulled down to the surface of the T cell and that allows the GP41 segment to uh, right here to push into 
this uh, this T cell's membrane because, of course, the GP41 has the hydro phobic transmembrane region, so it is the part that allows fusion. And so fusion is by GP41, whereas attachment is by GP120. And co-receptor is by the V3 loop of GP120. There's one other thing about this V3 loop that you need to know, and so I'm going to zoom out so I have a little bit more room to write. The V3 loop becomes important because antibodies will attack it, it becomes the spot, the, the site of neutralizing antibodies attacking it. The problem is it's hyper variable. So once the antibodies, once your body learns to set up an immune response, an antibody response towards this V3 loop, it changes and now the antibodies no longer bind to it. So let's look at what I've written here. I've written that we have the env, ENV protein, it's glycoprotein 160, synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, it gets glycosylated 25 to 30 times. The glycosylation step is required for it to have infectivity. I've put here that cellular proteases, not viral proteases, will cleave it into GP120 and GP41. So this is not a step that can be inhibited by a protease inhibitor. GP41 contains the transmembrane domain. GP120 contains the surface, uh, uh, remains on the surface, and it's non-covalently attached. And lastly, I've written that they are expressed in trimers. The GP120 binds to CD4. It has five hypervariable regions. The V3 domain determines its tropic preference. I've got CXCR4 versus CCR5, and some variants are dual tropic, meaning they will uh, have co they can bind to both the CCR5 and the CXCR4. And I've put that Maraviroc is a medication that that, that uh, binds to and inhibits access to the CCR5 receptor. It's in a CCR5 competitive antagonist. So I just went through this portion, and I want to add that virion binding to CCR5, those are called R5 strains, and they are said to be M-tropic. M meaning macrophage, and the CXCR4 are called X4 strains, and they are said to be T-tropic, meaning that they are able to infect T-cells. And the virions that can bind to both receptors are R5X4 strains, and they're said to be dual tropic. So here's the thing. We have a medication that can block this, uh, this binding to the co-receptor. It's called Maraviroc, and it can bind to CCR5. So it will do a lot of good in somebody who has an M-tropic virus. It will do some good in a person who has a dual-tropic virus, and it will do no good in a person who has a T-tropic virus. So you have to do ty viral typing before you start a person on this medication. And here's the other thing about that. A person who is infected for a long time, Let's, let's set, go through the life cycle of somebody who's been infected. So whenever you're first infected, this is a macrophage, and the virus will enter a macrophage, and it will start reproducing there, and it will uh, go into other cells and reproduce in those cells, and, and it will have that V3 region mutated constantly. So the first ce uh, cell to get infected will be by an M-tropic strain. But after a very short time, that V3 region will be uh, um, very is hyper variable, so it will be mutated enough times that it will become T tropic. So within a very short time, it will become T tropic, and then after it's T tropic, it will in, move into T cells and other cells with the CXCR4 co-receptor. A person who's been infected for a long time, their blood will show 90% of the of the virus is. T-tropic virion. However, whenever a person is initially infected, most of it is M-tropic. That's because the virus, when it gets into a mucosal surface or into a blood, uh, uh, an area that has blood nearby, the macrophages are going to be teeming there, so it's much easier to infect that person with an M-tropic strain. But after a while, T-tropic becomes dominant, and T-tropic becomes more easily sustained within a person's body. Now, we already talked about the implications for the medication Maraviroc, but there's another implication. There was a one person uh, in 2008, he had HIV. It was with a M-tropic strain. 
and he had just been initially infected, but he also needed a bone marrow transplant. I don't know why. I don't know who the patient is. It's just one of those things that's reported in science. He, was, he needed a bone marrow transplant, and so his doctor, being a wise person, went out and was identified a, a suitable donor who had a mutation, a homozygous mutation in the CCR5 gene, and because of that homozygous mutation, the, the M-tropic uh, virus could not infect any of his new bone marrow, any of his new blood cells, and so he has been, had undetectable levels of HIV since 2008. It is the one and only cure recorded so far um, to date of a person being cured completely of HIV. doesn't have to take any medication, doesn't do anything. He is completely virus-free. So theoretically, if gene editing were more uh, allowed, uh, right now it's very, very restricted, regulated, um, but if gene editing were more allowed and a person was uh, to have an infection with a completely M-tropic strain of virus and we were to do some gene editing to make them a homozygous mutant for the CCR5 gene, they could be cured from HIV. There's a little bit of, you know, politics for you to chew on. However, if there is any T-tropic strain, you will not be able to cure it, and you have put the person at a higher risk just simply due to the, the gene mutation, the gene editing. Uh, so that's sort of the pros and the cons. So GP120, it binds to CD4, it has five hypervariable domains, the V3 is important as a chemokine co-receptor, and it is important because it is what neutralizing antibodies typically will target. Also, the GP120 interacts with something called DC sign, it's on dendritic cells. Dendritic cells will use DC sign to present HIV to the T cell, and by the dendritic cell presenting it, it makes it even more infectious. GP41 mediates fusion, and there's a fusion inhibitor called infuvertide. Infuvertide binds to GP41 to prevent the fusion. So, pharmacology summary, we have entry inhibitors, Maraviroc is an anti-CCR5, and Infuvertide inhibits GP120. There are several others that are in trial right now, targets for the GP120, the GP41, the CCR5, CXCR4, and the CD4. And I'm just mentioning those here because they could be coming out and uh, approved by the FDA. Some look to be in Phase 2 and Phase 3 trials, so they could be approved within like days to months after I publish this video. Okay, we've knocked out LTR, GAG, POL, ENV, and now we're going to look at the regulatory elements, TAT and REV. And so I've listed them here, TAT and REV, and now let's look at what they do. So here we have the DNA genome, and it has been integrated inside of the host cell, and now RNA polymerase is being told you need to transcribe this gene. So remember earlier I said that we could, uh, the NF kappa B could bind to the LTR, so we're saying that this is the LTR segment from here to here, that it can bind there, and that it could activate transcription. And so that's what has happened. We'll say that NF kappa B is right here. It has activated transcription. Now, typically, once transcription has been activated, the RNA polymerase will make 100 to 200 base pairs, and then it will stop and release it, and it will start over again. And it just keep making this 1 or 200 base pairs, and it will, won't elongate the entire gene. But what will happen is TAT will bind to something called the TAR. We already heard about this earlier because we, we knew that other proteins bind this region inside of the actual virion. But inside of the cell, TAT will bind to this region of the mRNA. And what it does is it recruits other proteins. It recruits other proteins and it tells RNA polymerase to elongate the entire strand, to, to create the entire mRNA, you know, transcribe all of us. And so while TAT is not required for infectivity, it, uh, the virus can go inside of the cell and infect it, TAT is required to reproduce the virus. So without TAT, the virus cannot reproduce its deadness tracks. 
So let's look what I've written. HIV RNA transcription usually begins and terminates after a few hundred nucleotides. So it'll begin 200 nucleotides, it'll stop. TAT enhances HIV RNA production a thousand fold, and it does that by, by requiring it to elongate. TAT and cellular proteins, cyclin T, CDK9, etc., will bind to the RNA in the TAR stem loop region, causing the polymerase to elongate. And TAT has one other special feature. Some of TAT will leak out of the cell, and it gets taken up into other cells. It will actually enhance the transcription of certain genes in those other cells, and it's been known to enhance TNF-alpha, TGF-beta, and it will downregulate other genes like BCL2 and MYP1-alpha. So think about the implications there. I upregulate TNF in a nearby cell. TNF then feeds back on the cell that the virus is in, causing the, the um, increased release of NF-kappa B into the nucleus, which is going to cause the increased viral replication. And then that will cause the increased release of TAT. And, and it's a, it becomes a very circular process. If there were maybe somehow to scavenge up all of the excess TAT that's floating around or you know, somehow inhibit that, you could really do something to attenuate HIV um, infection. Now REV is a little bit different. So REV, inside of the nucleus, you've got your, your, um, your DNA and then you make your RNA. And once the RNA is produced, your, your cellular proteins, the nuclear proteins, as a matter of fact, will cut this up and splice it back together in different ways. It can be spliced, like I said, in 30 different ways. What REV does is REV inhibits splicing. It promotes the, uh, the export of fully formed RNA. So that's what I've written here is that REV, it's produced, it's produced from fully spliced RNA. So you can only get REV from fully spliced RNA. What it does is it prevents RNA splicing. And so by preventing RNA splicing, it downregulates the early genes and upregulates the late genes. This negative feedback happens because by down it downregulates its own expression. So it, it will downregulate its own expression. As soon as its levels start to drop off, its expression will return. And so that's how there's this seesaw of rev production if it were to, to keep going. And so how does it work? It binds an RNA stem loop that contains one non-Watson-Crick base pair. I don't know if this is, this is not medically important, but it's just scientifically interesting. So it binds to one non-Watson-Crick base pair. A GG is paired up in this RNA stem loop. So this RNA, as it's being produced, will fold back on itself, making the stem loop uh, structure. You know, so this is the uh, beginning of the RNA, this is the end, and then it's folded up on itself, making a stem loop structure, and somewhere in that stem loop structure, there's a non-Watson-Crick base pair, where a G is bound to a uh, binding covalent, or, or um, non-covalently to another G. And uh, this is called the uh, high affinity site for REV, or it's also called the REV response element, RRE. And now this also contains the nuclear export signal. So whereas most mRNA would go out a specific mRNA channel in the nucleus so that it could be processed by a ribosome, this mRNA is specifically carried out a 5S, out a channel that the 5S RNA from a ribosome or the snRNA would go out. So that signal is contained in the REV protein. Now the next thing we want to say is something that could become medically important soon, and that is that in solution, REV forms multimers. They, you know, three or four REV proteins will be bound together. And while they're bound together, if there's a mutant REV protein, and it has it, it is it has a bad nuclear export signal, it has a bad NES signal, then it becomes a dominant negative. It will trap this RNA inside the nucleus and prevent it from being exported out of the, the nucleus. So even if your wild type REV is working perfectly fine, when it multimers with this dominant negative REV, this mutant, the nuclear export signal is destroyed and it doesn't work anymore. And so maybe that could become medically useful.
soon, I hope. So now let's talk about the difference between early and late genes. The early genes are TAT, REV, and NEF. We haven't talked about what NEF is yet, but we'll get to that. And these are what are called, they are expressed independently. They're REV independent. They're expressed independent of REV. That means that they require splicing. That the, that the mRNA has to be cut and spliced and things have to be taken in and put out in order for these genes to be produced. TAT is partially REV dependent because it has two isoforms. One isoform is REV dependent, one is not. So it is an early and uh, partially late gene. But REV is fully REV, de uh, REV independent. So that means you can't have any REV at all if you want REV to be produced. NEF is also fully REV independent. And then all of the rest of these, we, we talked about these are the major ones you're going to read and learn about in a class. And then these are the accessory proteins. These are all REV dependent, meaning that REV has to be expressed and it has to prevent splicing from happening in order for these to be produced. And so you have, I said earlier, three ways to categorize the RNA in the HIV genome. And the RNA that's produced is unspliced RNA, which will produce GAG and PAL. Incompletely spliced, which will produce the envelope, the VIF, VPU, VPR, and one of the isoforms of TAT. And then you have the fully spliced uh, genes, which are REV, NEF, and the 2 exon form of TAT. So let's look at the map again. You can see, I'm going to zoom in on it, that TAT has two portions. It has this portion here and it has this portion here. And in order for that uh, entire protein to be synthesized, it, you have to have splicing. That's obvious. But this portion by itself also has TAT activity. REV, on the other hand, has a portion here and a portion here. And the entire thing is required for any activity. And lastly, you can see that here's the, the NEF gene right here, and it overlaps with the 3' LTR. That means that if you start transcribing that, if you don't do certain things to the mRNA, you're only transcribing the LTR and you're not getting NEF. Now here are the regulatory proteins. NEF, called the negative effector. VPR, called viral protein R, viral protein U and viral infectivity factor. Now, NEF is, a, is really a misnomer, but we're going to use it anyways. It's called the negative effector. The reason it's called that, originally, it was thought that high levels of NEF negatively uh, impacted the uh, production of HIV virions. It is now no longer thought to have any uh, connection to whether or not you get high or low titers of HIV. What it is believed to do now is to downregulate other proteins within the cell. So it downregulates CD4, it downregulates MHC, so it negatively affects these cellular proteins. Now let's talk about it really quick. So here's my cell surface, and up here I have my CD4 receptor. And it has this little cytoplasmic tail that hangs down here. This tail has uh, what's called the dilucine repeat, and NEF will bind to the dilucine repeat, causing it to be sucked in and endocytosed. The reason that it's thought that this is required, it's not necessarily 100% required, but the reason it helps is because the CD4 takes up all of the surface, and it doesn't allow for any virions to butt off. MHC is taken out of the surface as well, MHC class 1, and now this might be, you know, the virus doesn't have a brain and say, I'm going to do this for this reason, but one thing that it does is it prevents our, our body's CD8 cells from mounting an attack and killing infected CD4 cells. Now, NEF gets included into the budding virion, and it gets cleaved by protease. What happens to it and what it does after that, nobody is 100% certain at this time, but it does increase the infectivity tenfold. Now, earlier we talked about P17. P17 has a karyophilic element that, that tags. The, so what we have is our viral RNA, and then we have P17 that binds to it, and P17 has this signal that says, take me to your nucleus. On the other hand, VPR also binds here, 
it forms part of what is called the, the PIC, the pre-integration complex. And what is thought is that, let's say that this is the nucleus right here, it's thought that VPR binds to the nuclear pore. It tethers the genome to the nuclear pore, and that is its part in the PIC. So we can say that it tethers to the nuclear pore. We also know that it interferes with cyclin complexes trapping cells in G2. Now it's interesting that it traps cells in G2. It does not let cells uh, progress into mitosis. Um, the reason this is interesting is because the P17 and VPR proteins together, these two are required for this retrovirus to be able to move into a nucleus. Most retroviruses have to wait for a cell to divide. But not only does it not wait for a cell to divide, it stops the cell from dividing. I don't know if there's a lot of more clinical importance to that, except that you are, uh, you know, if it gets into a stem cell, it's preventing the stem cell from progressing. It's also thought to interact with something called uracil DNA glycolase, or UNG, and um, maybe what it does, so the uracil DNA glycolase is going to um, convert uh, C's to U's or U's to C's. It's going to change the DNA uh, um, nucleotides, and so by stopping that, it prevents the uh, HIV genome from being messed up. Now we said that NEF downregulates CD4. VPU also downregulates CD4, but it does it in a different way. Let's go back to uh, when we're talking about the glycoproteins, the GP120, GP41. They're inside of the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum, and they're sitting in here. We have our GP41 portion. We have our GP120 portion sitting in there. And you know GP120 likes to bind to CD4. What if we had a CD4 particle in here? It would sit and bind to that GP120, and it would trap it, and so it becomes useless. And so what VPU does is it binds to, let me change the color, it binds to the CD4 portion, tagging it for ubiquitination. So this gets all torn up, and now, and now it's free to go and do what it wants. And so what do we know? We know that it downregulates CD4 by tagging it for ubiquitination. It assists in virion budding. Exactly how it assists in virion budding is uncertain, but it might be that the downregulation of CD4 has uh, something to do with that. Now here's the interesting thing. VPU is formed from the same RNA as ENV. So we said ENV produces the GP120 and the GP41. So the same RNA that produces this also produces the VPU. And the VPU comes back and prevents this from being tangled up by CD4. It's just simply a different reading frame. It's polycystronic. So I've said here that ENV complexes with CD4 in the endoplasmic reticulum forming a CD4 ENV complex. VPU triggers CD4 ubiquitination, therefore re uh, releasing the ENV proteins. In absence of VPU, many virions can be seen stuck to the cell surface, so it doesn't get released as efficiently. And now last but not least, the viral infectivity factor. And the way this works is that it blocks an apolipoprotein B something something enzyme cleavage 3G. I'll, we'll look at it. So basically, this is required for HIV production in some cell lines. For example, macrophages and naive T cells. So there's this ApoBEC3G, and like I said, it's apolipoprotein B enzyme cleavage like 3G. We'll call it ApoBEC3G, and the ApoBEC3G is active in naive T cells. Once the T cell becomes activated, it turns this off and turns it into a big pile of junk. Well, it turns out that this enzyme is an antiviral, just part of the innate immune system. It is an antiviral protein, and so it will inhibit uh, HIV infection into the T cells. But once that T cell becomes active, it turns it off. And it so happens that viral infectivity factor inhibits the ApoBEC3G. So again, where is ApoBEC3G found? It's found in naive unactivated T cells, it's found in macrophages, found in some other cells, 
but for the most part, viral infectivity factor is not needed. If, if HIV enters into your body, it's going to find a cell that it can infect if you get a high enough load. And it's going to find that, it's going to infect it, and it's not going to need VIF. But for some cells, uh, VIF is required, and so it can increase its effectiveness, its chances of producing a whole bunch of virus if it can infect a lot more cells, and that's why this protein becomes important. And I want to come back at this because I just did say that the VPU is formed as part of the same mRNA that forms the ENV, the glycoprotein, uh, that get in the endoplasmic reticulum. So I wanted to re-show you that, demonstrate that on this figure. And also to show you that we have looked at the entire HIV genome structure and function. So as a quick review, this is, for, this is what you put on your flashcards to memorize. As a quick review, LTR binds to NF-kappa B and upregulates transcription. GAG binds to membrane and recruits viral proteins. P the P7 segment recruits the viral proteins. Uh, it also gets cleaved into the P24 capsid, the P17 matrix, which has also got part of the nuclear pre-integration complex, the P7 nucleocapsid, which facilitates reverse transcriptase, and P6 incorporates VPR and assists in budding. The pole gene has protease, reverse transcriptase, RNase H, and integrase. If you want to put what each of these does, then that's fine too. I think RNase H is the one that probably isn't mentioned as often, and that pulls off the RNA from the, the newly synthesized DNA. The ENV protein has GP120 and GP41, CD4 receptor and fusion, respectively. The GP120 has a V3 loop that is the site of the co-receptor and the site of antibody attack. The TAT, or transcriptional activator, binds to TAR on RNA and elongates RNA transcription. REV pulls unspliced RNA out of the nucleus. It transitions from the early late to the late genes. NEF is a negative infector. It, it affects the CD4 and the MHC. It causes them to be downregulated. It causes them to be endocytosed. VPR, viral protein R, is pulled into a virion by the P6 segment of GAG. It is part of the pre-integration complex along with P17. It tethers the genome to the nuclear pore. VPU, you can remember that U is ubiquitinate. Ubiquitinates CD4 inside the endoplasmic reticulum. This frees up all of the glycoproteins. It has other activities, not currently completely clear exactly how it works. Viral infectivity factor, you can just remember that it infects cells that have antiviral responses. That antiviral response is APOBEC3G. And with that quick review, we went through the entire HIV genome in two minutes. So here's my references. Robin's Pathologic Basis of Disease, the ninth edition, was great. What was even better is this site at the, uh, it's the HIV Insight at University of California, San Diego. The page was called Structure, Expression, and Regulation of HIV Genome, and this is the URL if you want to go check it out, but I got a lot of information that I didn't quite understand from that site. Wikipedia was used to get, make sure that I had a complete updated list of an antiretroviral medications whenever I went through those. Do not confuse my antiretroviral medication list with a pharmacology lecture on those things because each one of those medications has a lot going on as far as how it works and as far as its side effects that I didn't talk about. Things like how does didanazine cause pancreatitis. That's stuff you need to dig more into if you're trying to prepare pharmacologically. Alright, thanks for watching. Share this with your friends. Give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.